Good afternoon and welcome to the People with HIV in Leadership Institute. This is session two, Stigma, Intersectionality and Self-Care. I'm Amelia Khalil, the Senior Project Officer with the HIV AIDS Bureau in the Division of Policy and Data. And I'm honored to open up this session today. The leadership session is based on the Building Leaders of Color Training, or BLOCK. This module in particular is focused on stigma, intersectionality, and self-care. BLOCK is funded through the Minority HIV AIDS Fund and provides leadership training for people of color living with HIV throughout the United States. Before we dive into the training, I'd like to tell you a little bit about HRSA. HRSA supports more than 90 programs that provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically vulnerable through grants and cooperative agreements. Every year, the HRSA program serves tens of millions of people, including people with HIV and AIDS, pregnant women, mothers, and families, or people otherwise unable to access quality health care. As you will see in HRSA's vision and mission to provide optimal HIV care and treatment for all, and to provide leadership and resources to assure access to and retention in high quality integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people with HIV and AIDS and their families, this vision and mission aligns almost perfectly with what we're gonna to share today in Block and the purpose, mission, and goals of the Block program. Through the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, Block is able to reach over half a million people, half the people with HIV in the United States. And through its training, participants have provided input determining service delivery and funding priorities on planning bodies on local, state, and federal levels. What we are most proud of as part of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program is that our clients are virally suppressed more than 25% greater than the national average. In today's session, we're going to talk about multiple forms of stigma and how that impacts health outcomes, intersectionality and its relationship to improving care, and how you can get involved in your own self-care and in the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Our presenters today are two fabulous people. I'm so excited to be able to introduce them to you today. Charles Shazor and Lauren Miller, both from NMAC. They are seasoned experts and trainers in this content material, and I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. This is my contact information. Please feel free to send an email or call if you have any questions, and hopefully we'll be able to address those later in the session as well. Take it away, Lauren and Charles. All right, well, good day, everyone, and thank you again so much for joining us here for our second session. Um, again, my name is Charles Shazer Jr. I am an Associate Program Manager here at NMAC, and I will hand it over to my colleague, Lauren, to allow her to introduce herself. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Lauren Miller, Health Equity Program Coordinator at NMAC, and it's a pleasure to meet you. All right, so let's get this ball rolling. All right, so first up we have our learning objectives. Um, so just in a nutshell, at the conclusion of this virtual session, um, all of our participants will be able to define the impacts of stigma, determine key elements of stigma, explore how stigma impacts individuals living with HIV, define intersectionality, explain types of intersectionality, and explore the importance of self-care. All right, so we're going to keep on going here. Um, so again, this is our session on stigma, intersectionality, and self-care um, for the Building Leaders of Color virtual training workshop. Okay, and to keep pushing um, for our partners, um, up front we have NMEC, which is the program leadership. Um, again, we have our program partners, um, which will be the Positive Women's Network, or PWN USA. We also have United States People Living with HIV Caucus, and we also have Transforming HIV Resentments into Victories, Everlasting Support Services Incorporated, or Thrive SS Inc. 
So for the meat and potatoes, um, for the rationale of block, <clears throat> um, this is where we get all of our juice from. This is where we get our push and motivation. Um, but our rationale for block is to continue excuse me, to contribute to the national HIV goals by ensuring people of color living with HIV, including transgender um, women and men are equipped to provide meaningful input and guidance on achieving these goals via their participation on HIV planning bodies. And our purpose for the block program. Um, our purpose is, is to increase the numbers of persons of color living with HIV who are actively serving in leadership roles or engaged in leadership activities related to HIV related um, services at all level of decision making. Our guiding principles. So our special sauce. Um, the block is based on the Denver principles, which is the Bill of Rights or Declaration of Independence for the AIDS movement written back in 1983. At its core, the Denver principles demand a set of rights and recommendations for people living with HIV. And as well, these principles are built on social justice movements, building power for African Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, and Chicanos, women's health and LGBT liberation. Our guiding principles continue. Um, the principle of meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS, MEPA, demands that people living with HIV be substantively engaged in policy and pro programmatic decision making activities that impact our lives and fairly compensated for our participation, which is one of my favorite things. <laughs> All right, so the power of we. Um, before I jump into this, I want to make sure that we look at the visualization attached to this. Um, this is a very powerful statement and really helps guide a lot of the work that we do in Block. but it reads, nothing about us without us is for us. So keep that in mind when moving forward with um, working towards ending the HIV epidemic. We have to be included in this, all right? Um, but the power of we, um, the community of people living with HIV nationally and globally hold the value of diverse leadership and broad stakeholder engagement. Um, this value is demonstrated in the structures that govern and lead these communities. Our aims as leaders, simply put what you see on the screen right now, we, our aim um, as leaders is to build your skills, which will then outside of that build your confidence in order to take on these roles that we're looking to fill um, through the block program. All right, so jumping into our first, first section is stigma. All right, so with stigma, stigma is defined as a, as a structural, excuse me, social construct, construction that involves at least two fundamental components. The first component being the recognition of difference based on some distinguishing characteristic or mark and um, a consequent devaluation of the person. So just um, to kind of piece everything together and give us a little bit more with the stigma tree um, and understanding stigma a bit more, we want to make sure that we do a walkthrough activity. Um, and what's special about this um, is that this information will be given to you all from the trainer's perspective. So as a participant, won't exactly look like this, but for this session, we want to make sure that you all are able to go out into your communities, whether it be your friends, family, virtually, any space that you're in. Um, and conduct a stigma tree to kind of balance out things around HIV stigma or other things that are stigma related. Okay, so the main thing with this, um, the stigma tree. Um, stigma is and remains a significant barrier to care and treatment and has a measur measurable impact on health outcomes. To address stigma, we must understand where it comes from, what it looks like, and what it does to people and communities. So we're going to explore a quick and effective activity that will help us to identify the primary drivers, forms, and outcomes of stigma from your, excuse me, from our own experiences. All right, so the stigma tree. Instructions. So you want to divide your participants into three small groups if you're able to. Um, each group has, should have three color post-its, or post-it notes, and a newsprint um, with a leafless tree drawn on it. All right, and each group will have only 15 minutes to build their stigma tree. And with this, each group will conduct three brainstorms um, to identify how persons of color living with HIV experience stigma to build their stigma tree. So the first set of brainstorms should be focused on one being the cause of stigma, which will be the roots of your tree. 
Second leaf will be the forms of stigma, which will be the trunk of the tree. And third and final will be the effects of stigma being the branches. All right, so you will also instruct participants to transfer their brainstorm outcomes to the post-its and place it on the stigma tree. All right, so some examples to guide the brainstorming um, while leading the group um, and walking them through. Just some quick examples of the roots um, would be a lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, fear, stereotyping. Um, your forms can take on the presence of physical violence, emotional violence, um, segregation. Um, the effects um, of stigma will be based upon depression, isolation, and fear. Um, and so what you want to do after everyone has brainstormed, um, after about 15 minutes, you want to call time. Ask each group to present their stigma tree. If the stigma trees um, are very similar, ask groups two and three to only share the elements of their stigma tree that differ from the previous group's presentation. And so what this is, this is actually stigma trees that were developed through the block program. So literally our participants went through, did an amazing job, and when it got to the stigma tree, they produced some absolutely amazing work. Um, so we've done a number of trainings. So these are only three of the <laughs> stigma trees that come from our training. Um, but um, if you look at them closely, um, they literally mirror everything that we went over as far as the roots, cause, and effects of um, HIV stigma in our community. Okay, so we have the manifestations of stigma, and we'll go by these, go um, through these as well. But first up, there's public stigma, self-stigma, stigma by association, and structural stigma. All right, so the social physiological functions of stigma. So this pretty much is what it's meant to do. Um, so this is what people gain from um, pretty much projecting stigma onto others. But um, for this, the first one would be to keep people down. Um, you also, through stigma, you to make people um, conform to what you feel is right or what your particular beliefs may be. Um, and also to keep people away. So question, um, all of you who are listening here with us today, can you all name some examples of these different types of stigma? Um, so we'll go through them again. We have public stigma, self stigma, stigma by association and structural stigma. All right, and so what we wanna do here is kind of figure out how do people stigmatize? Um, what does that look like? Um, so a lot of times, um, even just through our programming and being able to have participants in the room um, and share that personal experience, we always wanna bring that back in um, and adjust the curriculum and adjust anything to make sure that it really reflects what we've learned moving forward for the next group. Um, so a lot of our participants have identified the things that you see here listed um, as far as how people stigmatize, but we've um, broken it down to isolation and rejection, um, shaming and blaming, um, enactic stigma, which is discrimination. So if you want to look at that one in particular, um, we, have, we hear a lot of issues around housing discrimination. So that would be a form of enacted stigma. Um, we also have self-stigma, self um, stigma by association. Um, and by association, it means, well, if you're working in the HIV field, then you must be HIV positive. And that's always not the case um, when it comes to HIV leadership and development, because we always need allyship. But that stigma by association is what that will be. Um, and layered stigma, which is intersectionality. Um, on this one, I'm going to pass it to Lauren, because that's exactly what we'll be covering next. Hello again. Today, um, I'll be speaking to you about intersectionality. Intersectionality is a term first coined in 1989 by American civil rights advocate Kimberly Williams Crenshaw to describe what she saw as failures of the system in responding to domestic violence against poor Black women. Intersectionality. Intersectionality promotes an understanding of human beings as shaped by the interaction of different social locations and identities. These interactions occur within a context of connected systems and structures of power. Through such processes, interdependent forms of privilege and oppression shaped by colonialism, imperialism, racism, homophobia, ableism, and patriarchy are created. 
intersectionality. According to an intersectional perspective, inequities are never the result of single distinct factors. Here are the tenets of intersectionality. People's lives are multidimensional and complex and cannot be explained through single identities. Relationships and power dynamics between different identities and oppressions are linked, and they can also change over time and space. People can experience privilege and oppression simultaneously based on context. And with social problems, the importance of an identity or structure cannot be predicted, but can be discovered through investigation. And furthermore, now tenets of intersectionality, individual experiences must be linked to broader structures of oppression, meaning analysis must occur on multiple levels. Scholars, researchers, policymakers, and activists must consider their own social position and power. This re reflexivity should be in place before setting priorities and directions in research, policy work, and activism. Furthermore, intersectionality is explicitly oriented towards transformation, building coalitions among different groups and working towards social justice. And now we're going to go through our activity walkthrough. It's called the lenses. All of us come to the table with multiple identities and these identities are reflections of the communities and cultures we come from. Some examples are race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender identity, but it could also be your economic class or your education level. And these identities affect our view of the world and thus our lens of the world. So in the activity, you have um, a pair of lenses and in the lenses you will put your, um, how you identify your intersectional identities, which would be race, ethnicity, ethnicity, gender, economic class, and even education level. So you will wanna ask the participants how you identify yourself. And the participants should consider how they identify using the lenses handout. So you will have the participants fill in the lenses with these identities and be prepared to have the participants share back with the larger group. Remember, we all have multiple identities such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, economic class, religious affiliation, education level, and geography. So for the report back, you wanna ask participants to share, what lenses do you view the world through? In the debrief, you wanna do the participant follow-up questions. The first one you would ask is, what identities align with one another? Second, what identities conflict with one another? Third, what makes them in conflict with one another? And for the fourth, how do you or did you reconcile the two? Fifth, have you ever experienced stigma as a result of your identities? What happened and how did you handle it? Sixth, have you ever had to minimize or hide your identity because of the fear of being discriminated against? And finally, have you ever stigmatized or discriminated against someone? If so, what happened? Now, jumping into self-care, I'll pass it back over to Charles. All right, thank you so much, Lauren. I greatly appreciate that. So now we're gonna take a quick walk through self-care because this is so important in the work that we do. Okay, so self-care, you wanna ask yourself, what is self-care? And also, why is it important? So what is self-care? Self-care is an individual's decision to modify behavior in order to improve health and well-being. All right, so really just to take a quick look at the types of self-care, um, we have physical self-care, psychological self-care, emotional self-care, spiritual self-care, and social self-care. And why self-care is so important. So with self-care, the um, self-care can increase the likelihood of seeking medical care in time of need. 
maintaining medical adherence um, and really with our ending the HIV epidemic, medical adherence is extremely important. So that's why self-care is also a great tie-in for that as well. Um, but it also will help to improve diet and exercise, um, reducing substance use and obtaining social support. So self-care, and this is self-care as you lead. Um, so of course, what we're looking to do with Block is to build leaders of color. So we want to make sure that our leaders are also aware, not just to really just put how important self-care is, but also put in that practice into care for yourself. All right, so understanding as a leader and as you lead with self-care, um, that good self-care may keep you focused on your health needs. As well, um, self-care may help you with addressing any stressors, mental health, and substance use concerns. Also, good self-care may improve your personal engagement with your own healthcare provider and align your wellness goals. So just to cover quickly, we'll go over our stress reduction checklist or what I call SRC. All right, so tips for stress management. So first you wanna to remember to set priorities and focus on what's important. Let the other stuff go completely. All right, um, also in a, in, excuse me, identify tasks that you share, um, that you can share or delegate, um, and then ask for help. And it's okay to need help or assistance with anything. Um, third, we wanna get organized. Um, disorder can make things confusing and harder to remember. Four, um, set short-term goals you can reach reward yourself for meeting them. I know me personally, um, when I come to my goals and things like that, when that paycheck comes, like I know instantly, I would want to get me a pizza, something just to treat myself that got me through the week and helping me keep my sanity. Um, so for me, that's a quick little something and also self-care. Um, so again, it's okay to say no gracefully um, and to take no more obligations. And what I always like to advise people with saying no, it's okay to say no. Um, but the great thing is if you say no, if you have a follow-up. So you know what? No, I may not be able to do this session, but however, I do have a great teammate, Lauren Miller, who will be perfect for this job. So that's something that you can do in order to say no and still keep your own um, grace around it, but also still provide a solution to the no. All right? So laugh. <clears throat> Look for human everyday life or watch a funny video. And really right now in this virtual space, I think that's what we're all doing. <laughs> um, also to listen to music, choose tunes that will relax and revive you. And lastly, talk to a counselor or a friend. Um, and just with that number eight for me is very important because many times as communities of color, mental health or speaking to a counselor or you know, saying that you have to go through a therapy session, it's almost taboo. You don't wanna talk about it. Um, but understand in this work and in this life that it's okay to talk to a counselor, it's okay to speak to a friend, share your experience, look for help, look for assistance. You don't have to take on everything by yourself. All right, and this is too good to leave out. So you wanna remember things to do, excuse me, remember things don't have to be perfect. Sometimes good enough is just fine. All right, and you also wanna take time out for yoga, meditation, or some deep breaths. Um, and what I will share with you is that I have never been a huge person with meditation or the breathing exercise and all that, but we do have an amazing staff person named Miguel Angel um, Diaz Martinez, who leads our meditation weekly um, for NMAC. And I will share my experience with you that I'm thinking a lot more clearly. Um, my stress level has gone down and it's also um, as a staff actually helped us create additional bonding space. Um, so please look into that as well. But also get regular exercise. Find something you'd like to do um, that you can work into your schedule. You also want to set aside some time, even if it's just five to 10 minutes for yourself each day, just to breathe and reflect and plan. All right, um, so that concludes our session. Um, we want to thank you so much for taking your time here with us today. Um, and we have our contact information coming up towards the end. Um, so we'll be sure to make sure you can have that. But in the meantime, we want to make sure that if you have any questions around the Building Leaders of Color program, um, please visit our website, which will be www.mac.org slash program slash the center slash block. And lastly, this is our contact information for myself and Lauren Miller. Um, again, our phone number, well, my phone number, excuse me, is 202-302-7515, or you can reach me by email at cshazer at nmac.org. Um, and for Lauren Miller, her contact is 202-997-0951,
or she can also be reached at lmiller at mmac.org. Um, thank you all again so much for joining us and we definitely look forward to hearing from you all soon.